All right, friends. Uh, welcome back to End Time Church. Uh, I'm Chris Manti. That's Chris Anderson. And that's Tyrannosaurus girding up the whole operation, as usual. Look, see? She's stronger than she Hold looks. Uh, amen. And welcome to you as well, friends. And uh, I, want, I, I, I don't want to give away the behind-the-scenes stuff, but Chris has a lot of power now, Chris Anderson. And so we have uh, there's a there's a cool thing that we added to our technology here that basically allows him to push all the buttons. So I'm just trying to give give up, you know, let go and let God, uh, stuff like that. It's very very healthy, right? We can't control everything. That's a good thing. I didn't realize you were also a control freak. Uh, it seems like it. All ten, on Monday nights, during when the buttons need to be pushed, kind of a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My old soundboard radio days come right back to me. Like, okay, gotta go down, gotta go down, gotta go down. Anyway, welcome, friends. Uh, we are looking forward to this uh, evening with you all and with the Lord tonight, uh, as always. If you or are, with y'all, if you're done south, uh, all y'all, <laughs> all y'all, which is the whole globe. And we are uh, so happy to be able to do this because we have this opportunity, we have this technology that can go literally all over the world, and we do. And so if you are at the End Time Church page itself, we, we, we don't want to say we love you more, but we really appreciate you today, okay? Uh, because we do love that you're there. Please go ahead and say hello and where you're from. And if you're new or if you're here for a millionth time, we haven't been on that many times, but still. three seems like we're getting years. close. It seems like it a little bit. Uh, three, three years and eight months or whatever it is. Uh, a, a, a bit of a time. So uh, just chime in and say hi if you want to chat away during the uh, any time tonight. Just go ahead and put your comment, suggestion, prayer request, anything. It's just hellos, loves, all of that is good. Go ahead and do that. Uh, and then there's a button right next to chat called prayer. If you click on that, there's a link that says click here to contact us now. It doesn't have to be for prayer. It could be for anything. Just to say hello or uh, make contact, whatever. Go ahead and use that at your leisure. It'll come right to us. You can try uh, to- Sell us something, you know, just try to sell us something. I yeah. guess we could. Anything. You could try, sure. <laughs> you, no can rules. Try. you can try. No no rules about that. Uh go ahead. Uh, Speaking no of selling something, we should sell that uh that cool app that's absolutely free. It's actually not selling. <laughs> so let's sell let's sell that thing for zero dollars. Absolutely, please get it. Uh Get the app. Just type in app.endtime.church. That will take you direct to your device's um, location, whether it be the App Store for your Apple device or, or Google Play or even on your computer. Get right to the uh, web version of it, and which is pretty cool, by the way. The web version is pretty, pretty rocking. Um, you see it at the bottom of the screen there if uh, you want to know what it is. This is the power that I'm talking about. See, I'm not doing anything. It just happens. It's going that way. Oh, your fingers, right? <laughs> Magic hand, something. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, please get the app. It's really cool and useful. And uh, you don't have to wait till Monday nights. You can do it literally anytime, any any day, any hour, regardless of what time zone you're in. Um, come to think of it, if, if you're in a different time zone and you don't usually, you know, you aren't awake or you're at work or whatever during this time when we're live, uh, maybe we should expand that, right? We've I, I've always been open to that. We've always been about that. Um, if there's some other way to uh, make that work, maybe it's another, you know, host who lives somewhere else or whatever. And we want to, you have an idea? God put something on your mind about it? So let's maybe talk about perhaps, it. Maybe perhaps a pastor friend that lives in Portugal, who knows? For example. For example. For example, that would have been <laughs> perfectly perfect. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we do have a buddy who lives in Portugal who's been with us the whole time. Uh, anyway, that's that's up to the Lord, right? But we want to make it easy as possible, right? Easy as possible to connect with the body uh, throughout the world. So that's why this exists. That's why the app uh, exists. And that's why we do this thing every single week. Uh, the playlist button's also on the site. That's for older messages. Uh, the past couple of weeks, we've been going through Daniel and all that stuff. And we'll finish that up next week, Lord willing. Uh, and hit the share button, please. So easy. How much easier could you get? Hit the share button and tell folks that you're watching this and that this is a good place to be. And wow, I never knew such a thing existed. You know, tons of churches now have 
you know, online um, campuses or, you know, online expressions of their local thing or just, you know, a live stream of their local church. I have that at my, you know, at home, you guys, you know, Chris, I know you got like, that's everywhere now, but this was not established like that. You know, we, we were intentionally um, online only because for a lot of reasons, but point is there is no, we've got an email this week. I think it was like, Hey, are you attached to this such and such church in California? Right. I'm like, wedding, yeah. uh, no, <laughs> no, we're just, we're going to leave the name out. But the point is like, no, we're not. Okay. Um, nope. This is just, this is what it is. This is the central meeting location. This is our sanctuary uh, right here. It happens to be with a beautiful city in back of me here in Wilmington or a beautiful living room. Etc. Whatever it Delaware. is, it's wherever you are. Yeah. You're in Delaware. All right, Wayne. <laughs> enough of that of you. Uh, yeah. So uh, please just chime in, share with what's on your heart tonight. Uh, we want to get the worship of the Lord going for sure. But anyway, just see all the buttons that you have available to you. Use them, hit them. And the Give Now, of course, is there because we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. And that's no joke. There it is. Holy Spirit's driving this train tonight because I don't know how that's happening. It's just happening. It's just ha- It's happening. <laughs> so if if you're blessed by it hey lord i was blessed by this what should i do you know um that's how we're operating so uh please please do that and be generous in that because we all hear the line right god loves a cheerful giver but it's true it's really true uh it's so much better when you really are into it uh so we we all do it all of us here that you're looking at right we're, we all do it it's a practice it's a it's a habit thing to put your flesh in its place all that good stuff Anyways, feel free to do that. And tonight we're going to hear uh, from Pastor Anderson about discipleship, which is really, really cool. Because what else is there? I mean, honestly, like we, we can go, right? We can talk about eschatology and all these things all day long. But if we're not following Jesus, and if we're not discipling others to follow him, what the heck are we doing? I don't know. I don't know. That seems like the first step. Like if we're not doing that, we got nothing. All right. Um and it is it is happening. Oh, well, although not the rapture. Sorry. Um, yeah, is that Russian? I can't. Or I'm not sure what language that is. Sorry, friend. But anyway, thank you. Yeah, we we got you there. No rapture tonight, guaranteed, hundred percent. The Lord told me, uh, and all of us, He did. So, anyways, we want you to be comfortable. We want you to say hello. Uh, we're going to be taking our worship to the Lord here with. Tyrannosaurus, uh, what? I'm sorry, I already forgot what you wanted to mention. Oh, hallelujah! Yeah, what? What about what about this little project? Yeah, we're kicking off Advent season tonight, um, starting with some kind of prophetic um, hymns that I think are really exciting. I love old school Advent music um, very much, and we're going to culminate uh, at the end of December. Right after Christmas, um, or around Christmas, I haven't picked the date, but it'll be the final end time church service in December, um, whatever date that may be. And we are going to live stream um, a recording of the Hallelujah Chorus, which I have posted um, in the group. I will repost it because it's probably buried by now, but everyone's vocal part. So if you're a man with a low voice, you would sing the bass part. If you're a man with a slightly higher voice, you would sing the tenor part. Um, and if you are a woman with a slightly lower voice, the alto and the highest, the soprano. So I've got all four of those vocal parts. They're free. You can kind of learn yours. Um, hallelujah chorus flash mobs have been known to happen in public. And they are extremely um, powerful for witnessing the gospel. Um, people actually go crazy. I remember. Uh, People were going bananas a few years back when I was in a live, um, a beautiful live, which I'd like to see every year at Christmas, Hanukkah time. Um, and there was a man there who was like, you know, I'm Jewish. And so, like, I don't believe this Christianity stuff, but wouldn't it be nice if this stuff was true? Like, his heart was so moved by the scriptures. And if you haven't ever listened to Handel's Messiah, which I'm, I'm kind of, gathering that some people in our generation even have never heard it. It's a very long work of music that's interspersed with solos and choral pieces. The choral pieces are very accessible to everyone. In fact, they're, I think that we'll sing them in the kingdom. I don't 
I, I've, I haven't encountered much other music on this earth that I think will happen, but in the kingdom, <laughs> but it'll probably be better. But um, yeah, so anyway, that's what it is. The choruses are profound. I'll post a few of them over the next month and the Hallelujah Chorus at the end. Traditionally, um, people will stand for it. And of course, it starts with Hallelujah. For our Lord God, omnipotent reigneth. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And those are the lyrics. Every lyric from Handel's Messiah is just scripture, and it's all prophetic scripture. It it actually tells most of the eschatology that we geeks are into. It winds right up through Handel's Messiah. All of it. So that's the spiel. So participate. Yeah, Yeah, man. Yes. Learn your part. If you can't, and or if you're like I'm tone enough, like you can just rap it or you can yell it, like at your house. Rap it. And just yell, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. That is an awesome idea, and yeah. uh, it'll get it get you out of your shell a little bit. Hey, I'm sorry, uh, Bulgarian. Yeah, Evo. Right. You're right. I do remember you now. Sorry about that, <sighs> dear brother. Mm. Bulgaria. Bulgaria. I know. I know. I actually know someone from. Bulgaria in real life. Weird. Um, I was in Afghanistan with some Bulgarians. Is that right? Yeah. Like like fighting folks. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm doing a transport, my first deployment, going over to Kandahar. A um, bunch of Bulgarians in there. It was funny because we did a combat dive, which is where you're in the airplane like this, and it just goes down, kind of swirls to go to landing. Yeah. And nobody had their weapons secure. So the Bulgarians had them in their lap versus in between their legs. And when it went up, you lost gravity, right? And so, like, you see all these, like, SKSs and AKs and stuff, like, flying up in the air. They're reaching up and grabbing them. So That's yeah. ridiculous. That, that'll learn them. That's right? how I remember the Bulgarians. <laughs> Hold on to your weapons, Bulgarians. Yeah. Come on. Sword of the spirit. Don't let it go. Oh, man. That's, that's good, cool. good people, though. Good folk. Yeah. Amen. All right, uh, let's 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 get this music then. Um, Taryn's got some awesome. I love that she. I mean, she's really going all out with this stuff. This is original. This is you don't hear this anywhere. So I I appreciate that. And um, when you. we come back, we will uh, pray together, and then we will hear from the preacher of the evening and actually get into it. Right, get into some feedback and all that awesome stuff. So let's do the worship of the Lord because He is worthy and he's good so stand by a steep pull <laughs> stand by a really long time because i hit the wrong button so what was that about control about uh... nothing nothing at all people <laughs> Be the death of me. You're You're just feeding off
Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's go to the Father together. Father, we come to you now in the name of your Son, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua, the King of Israel, and of all who believe. We believe your word and trust that when two or three are gathered in your name, there you are also. So we believe and trust that you're here now. That you've heard our praises to you, that it has ascended to your throne, and you are pleased with our worship of you. We ask that your Holy Spirit now be with every single one of us. And because you are the Lord of time, even those who are not here right now watching, those who would come later today or later in this week or weeks later would have the same Holy Spirit and you would speak the same word to them in due season. And we would be penetrated by your perfect heart, that your heart would be ours. Uh, and as we just sang tonight, something so poignant, and we say, Maranatha, we say, come, the long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth you are. Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. And we declare that we long for you, Jesus. We love you. We need you. And we want to be your disciple. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Anderson, friend, stage is yours. All right. Well, uh, just I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, it's just a blessing and honor uh, to speak with you tonight, uh, whether you're watching at your homes, uh, whether you're watching at work, listening at work, wherever you're at, YouTube, Facebook, endtime.church. I just wanted to extend uh, my, my welcome to you tonight, and I pray that this uh, message strikes home. So t- tonight, I wanted to talk about four specific traits of a biblical disciple. You see, a lot of what we hear in the world today, in the church world today, about discipleship, it's it's good, it's great, but we're not really quite looking like a biblical disciple looked. We're in we're in the process, right? We we are moving towards that biblical disciple image to being a follower of Christ. We're moving towards that every day. It's called the process of sanctification. But if we don't know what we're working towards, if we don't know what we are moving to, how will we know if we ever get there? Is there ever a time where we achieve that objective and we get to the point where we can say that, hey, my life looks like a biblical disciple? Could we ever get to the point where we say, hey, my life looks like Paul? My life looks like Peter. My life looks like John. My life looks like Philip. Could we ever get to the point where we could say that? And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't know if I can or can't. I I got a lot going on in my life. I have a lot of things. I have a lot of stuff. And I don't know if I could ever get to the point where I could say that I look like Paul or that I look like Peter or I look like John or I look like Philip. But they had to start somewhere, too. And even in their walk of faith, they messed up. Peter, two times, Scripture points out. Once when he denied Christ three times, and Jesus restored him and bestowed on him the pastoral mantle. And the second time when he segregated himself during the love feast, and Paul called him out in front of everybody. So what are you doing? Why are you segregating yourself, separating yourself? Biblical disciples mess up. Biblical disciples stumble. If you're listening tonight and you're saying, I don't know if I can get to that point because I have a lot of stuff in my life. I I stumble a lot. I mess up a lot. Take heart. So did Peter. But I'm here to offer you some encouragement tonight that you can 
take on the traits of a biblical disciple. You can do that through co-laboring with the Holy Spirit in that process called sanctification, where we are becoming more and more like Christ in our thoughts, in our actions, in our words. We're all going through it. We all stumble. We all fall. But it's about getting back up and keeping in the press. It's about keeping in the faith. So tonight, I really just want to open up with a story. And this story is about a man named Reverend John Harper. Now, Reverend Harper was a Scottish pastor. and He lived at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century. And he was a man of God. He had suffered many different setbacks in his life. Uh, tragically, his wife had passed away. He had a child that was very sick. He himself had drowned once, didn't die, came close to it, didn't. He had suffered a great illness at one point in his life that left him weak. And yet in his weakness, the man was a preacher. He pastored a church in Scotland. And he was even connected with the Moody Church in Chicago. Some of us may have heard of the Moody Church in Chicago. He was connected with that. He had gone and preached revival services there for months on end. And in 1912, he was invited to go back to Chicago to preach the gospel for a three-month stint at the Moody Church. And Reverend Harper was a man of God. His heart was on fire to tell people about Jesus Christ, even though he was frail and weak because of past sicknesses, even though his wife had died and he had to take his child with him, his daughter, he was committed and saying, I'm going to go preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as he told his, his church about it, he told them, I've booked passage on the state-of-the-art ship, the Titanic, and I'm going to America, and I'm going to preach the gospel. And his parishioners prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed over him. They prayed over the ministry. They prayed, prayed over the entire trip, and one of them the Lord had put an impression on his heart to tell Reverend Harper that he needs to take another ship. And this parishioner even said, I will be willing to pay the cost of a new ticket for you and your daughter if you go on the Lusitania instead of the Titanic. But Reverend Harper, he said, no. And the parishioner said, I have a foreboding feeling that if you were to go, something bad is going to happen. And Reverend Harper said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go preach because that is what I'm called to do. And so despite the parishioner's warning and saying, there's a foreboding feeling, Reverend Harper said, I'm going anyway. And he booked his passage on the Titanic. And shortly thereafter, him and his daughter boarded the ship. And the Titanic made two different stops before its voyage across the Atlantic. It stopped in France. Some people got off. Some people came on. And it stopped in Ireland. And when it was in France, he sent a telegraph. He said, hey, everything's going great. Everything is going fine. The voyage is fine. It's an incredible ship. We're having a good time. And he talked about he was witnessing to people on the ship. On the way to go preach a three-month stint in Chicago, he was preaching en route. He was telling people about Jesus. And throughout the voyage, his fellow passengers, who would be enjoying the luxuries of the ship, enjoying the, the lavishness of the excess of this grand achievement of modern engineering marvel, and this man was going, Reverend Harper, and he was sharing Jesus Christ with every passenger who he could strike a conversation with. The man's heart was for the lost. And as you all know the story of the Titanic, one night it struck the iceberg, ripped through six watertight seals, in the hull, and the ship began to take on water, and she began to sink. And that night, 
witnessed selfishness on a grand scale where men were dressing as women to get on a lifeboat because the lifeboats were only for, for women and children. And people were fighting to get onto the, the life rafts and they were even casting off of, of the Titanic and going in the water half full. And there were people in the water drowning, freezing to death, falling overboard. They were still, they want, they just, they were leaving. Supreme act of selfishness. But Reverend Harper, in the midst of a sea of selfishness, was a beacon of hope, demonstrating selflessness in the face of impending doom. He took his life vest and he handed it to a passenger. And the passenger said, what are you doing, sir? You need this. And he said, I know where I'm going. But I'm afraid you may not. And you need this more than I do. And at the same time, he took his little six-year-old daughter. He found a woman that was boarding one of the life rafts. And he gave his daughter to this woman and said, take care of her. She has family in Scotland. Her mother's dead and I'm going to be too. Take care of her. And the woman took Reverend Harper's daughter on the life raft. Later on, that, that same little girl made her way back to Scotland, ended up marrying a minister, had many children. But Reverend Harper went down with the ship. He was in the water. In that icy cold water, it wasn't drowning that killed you. It was freezing to death. And there were people floating in their life vests, screaming in pain as if it were a million knives stabbing into them because of the cold of the water, freezing literally to death. And here his Reverend Harper, struggling, no life vest. He had given it up. He's, he's, he's treading water with this feeling of being stabbed. And he's all at the same time preaching the gospel, shouting, Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Every person that floated by him, he would say, believe on the Lord of Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. One specific man named George Henry Calville was on a piece of of wreckage floating by. And he float by and Reverend Harper said, have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? And he said, no. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And the man floated away. And Reverend Harper's treading water, starting to to sink into the water, to the icy grave. And then the man, George Henry Cavill, floated by again a second time. And Reverend Harper said, Have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ yet? And the man said, no, not yet. Pray for me. And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And the man floated off. And at this point, the sound of the screams was dying down. There were very few left. And Reverend Harper breathed his last breath and sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Not much longer after that, in Ontario, Canada, That same man floating by on the debris, George Henry Calvin, testified at a church that he was Reverend John Harper's last convert. For that same man that floated by, was picked up later by the SS Carpathia, one of the Carpathia's rescue ships. My friends, Reverend Harper demonstrated a modern day example of a disciple of Jesus Christ. He demonstrated selflessness above all. His little girl, her mother had died already and it was just him, gave his six-year-old daughter to someone else to save them while he went after souls. And he saw people come into Christ even in the midst of his own death. See, disciples of Christ are men and women from all walks of of life. Matthew was a tax collector. We see in Matthew 9, verse 9, one of the Simons was a zealot. He was known for his zeal, but he was a very obscure man. Not much talked about him in scripture other than his zealousness. Andrew, the brother of Peter, 
was a disciple of John the Baptist. And both Peter and Andrew, James and John, all four were fishermen. And likewise, many others, even among the 70 that followed him. People from all walks of life. Just like you and me are from all walks of life. We're from all different backgrounds. We have different religious upbringings. We have different nationalities even. We have different races even. We're from all walks of life. And that makes us very much like the disciples. Yet their lives were radically changed when they met the Messiah who bid them, come, follow me. Much like you and I, if we have been born again, our lives too have been changed when Jesus said to us, come, follow me. When we believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we were saved by God's grace through our saving faith, our lives are different. And if you can say, Pastor Anderson, my life is not much different than it was before I came to Christ, then I would have to ask you, is your confession of faith genuine? Do you have true saving faith? What are your works? Jesus said you'll know my disciples by the love. Is love a work of yours? What fruits are being displayed in your life tonight? And yet every one of the disciples of Christ left their former lives, their families. Peter was married, had a mother-in-law that was healed by Jesus. Church tradition even says that Philip was married and had four daughters. We even see about the daughters mentioned in the book of Acts. And yet these men followed Christ. Each one of them found a cause worth more to them than any earthly relationship, treasure, passion, or pursuit. For they had encountered God and wanted others to encounter him too. You see, one of the passions of a disciple of Christ is that they want to share in their experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. They want to experience God's love and God's favor and God's mercy on other people. Not just their lives, but on those they love. Even on those they don't love. You know, it wasn't just the twelve. You know, he said, going to the uttermost parts of the earth, the gospel had to come to America at some point. It had to come to Ireland at some point. It had to come to Australia at some point. And it was a disciple of Christ that brought the gospel. That is called actionable faith. The disciples became students to the rabbi, Yeshua, the Messiah. They live, their lives were defined by learning. They were continuous learners. Trial and error. We got to exercise our faith. And you know what? Sometimes it doesn't always play out the way we want it to. And that's called trial and error. We learn and we grow in those learning mistakes. A kid doesn't learn to ride the bike without falling a few times. Neither do we learn to exercise our faith without getting out there and doing something about it. And when we go and we experience that trial and error and that learning, we grow in our faith. The word says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They grew in fellowship with one another and with others. And they grew in submission to Christ. Humbling themselves to him. They grew in a common confession of faith in humility and compassion. And a singular common cause, which was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want to take a brief momentary pause and hopefully not dive too far in this rabbit hole. But I want to say this, and I want to ask this question of each and every one of us tonight. What is the common cause of the church that you are gathered at? What is the common cause of the local fellowship where you are going every week? I hope you're going every week. What is the common cause? It is, is it the cause of Christ, which is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or is it the cause of getting your name out there? Is it the cause of selfish gain? What is the cause of the church that you are with? That you are attending. What is the cause of end time church tonight? And I say if it's not to preach the gospel. If it's not to evangelize. If it's not to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Then perhaps our priorities aren't in order. 
When Jesus was crucified, the remaining 11, minus Judas, they hid in fear. But their faith exploded when Jesus appeared to them and walked with them for 40 days before he ascended to the right hand of God. And from the time of the empowering of the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 2, at the Feast of Shavuot, until they just died, the disciples' lives were marked by learning of the Lord through the Holy Spirit, exercising their faith in all boldness, and walking in the various fruits of the Spirit. So I want to first talk about this first trait, which is called humility, something we all really need to work on, especially in the West, myself included. Humility is a trait of discipleship in both Old and New Covenant worshipers. There's multiple scriptures to, to back this up. Psalms 10, verse 12, Psalms 147 and 6, Isaiah 57, 15, James 4, verse 6 through 10, 1 Peter 5, verse 5 through 6, and I can go on and on and on. St. Augustine believed that only a genuinely humble person could achieve greatness. But what greatness was he talking about? Human greatness is not the objective of a Christ follower are walking in humility. But it's the greatness of Jesus Christ and the crucified, living a cruciformed life with Christ living through us. Paul said, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That becomes the focus, the object of greatness that St. Augustine was talking about. This occurs through genuine humility. It is the exaltation of Christ above all else. John the Baptist knew this when he spoke uh, of his own decrease in order for Christ's ministry to increase. The Baptist knew the one greater than him must have complete control, total dominance, and full authority. Disciples of Christ therefore seek to exalt Jesus above themselves. Do we see that in our churches today? Is the pastors exalting Christ above their own prestige, above their own name, above their own fame? Is Christ the one who is the center of worship or is it the act of worship and the music? There's a significant difference between true worship in spirit and in truth. And then what we see today on stages across the church. You see, it went from, throughout history, it went from the communion table, the altar, to the pulpit, to the stage. That's been the progression of the focus of Christianity and our methodologies for over a thousand years. It started off with don't desecrate the altar. This was in the Roman Catholic movement, and then the Protestant Reformation took place, and it became about sola scriptura, about the the word alone, and saved salvation by faith alone. It became about the pulpit, about the preacher, about the minister preaching the word of God. And now it is transformed again, where it's no longer about the preacher, but it's about the team. It's about the entertainment. It's about the stage. And through all of it, we've lost sight of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's about Jesus Christ and him crucified, the center focus of what our faith should be all about. And so I ask tonight, in this trait of discipleship and humility, are we making Christ Jesus the center of our worship? Are we making him the center of our passions? Are we making him the center of our thoughts? Are we making him the center of our speech? Is he our all in all? Or is he simply somebody... We go to when we want to. Are we satisfied with Jesus as our Savior only? Or do we worship him as Savior and Lord of our life? And if we're not keeping him as the center of our worship, then we cannot say that he is the Lord of our life. And to say that would be a lie. The prophet Zephaniah calls the rebellious house of Judah to repentance in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1 and 3, 1 through 3. In his call, he tells the people to uphold or follow the law of God, the Torah, and seek righteousness and humility. All three traits are the traits of discipleship, all three things, to obey the, the word of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and his commandment is to love. 
That we would seek righteousness to do the right thing. Righteous living means that we are following what the Lord says to do and seeking humility, to be humble. The church today finds herself equally rebellious as the house of Judah was. Zephaniah's heartfelt call of repentance echoes true today. We must seek humility, righteousness, and walk according to the commandment of Christ, which is love. And that is the second trait I want to talk about tonight. Paul spends a great deal of his time discussing love in his various letters. His overarching theme regarding Christian character is that love must rule a believer's life. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the entire chapter. Jesus said that his disciples would be known for their love of one another. We see that in John 13, verse 35. Are you known by your love? It's a question to ask. All of us, myself included, am I known by my love? Love defines a disciple's life, governs their thoughts and actions, and characterizes their convictions. A man named Larry Gant best describes agape love, the type of love we're talking about, as an other-centered orientation to love God and love others through service and selfishness, selflessness. Such a selfless action was demonstrated by Reverend John Harper when he went down with the Titanic. Unlike the self-centered nature of an unregenerated or not born-again individual, the reborn disciple strives to serve others and demonstrate selflessness as an act of agape love, an act of service and an act of selflessness. Congregations today, even here at End Time Church, in our own ways, serve our local communities by operating food banks and kitchens, gathering and distributing clothes to the homeless and the poor, conducting remodeling and renovation projects on dilapidated homes for the less fortunate, and generally give of their financial blessings and charitable donations to various groups. Selfless service is in time. Do you give of your time selflessly? It is in your finances. Do you give of your finances selflessly? And it is gifts, uh, various gifts and things that continue in our spiritual heritage of agape, and they bring honor to God. You know, we talked about tonight, you know, giving to End Time Church. Uh, you know, that's something that, you know, Pastor Manti and myself and the other leaders here at End Time Church, we make it a point to say, as the Lord leads you, so give. And I want to, again, reiterate that, as the Lord leads you, so give. But at the same time, you know, if this is being a blessing to you, then a selfless service, a mark of love towards end time church would be a, a, a giving of your time, would be a giving of your financial blessing. Anything that you could do to help out in anything that we have, there's always something going on we need some help with. You know, selfless service is an act of agape love. Stephen, the first martyr, and there were six others who were chosen to serve the tables. They were chosen to, to be waiters, essentially. And this was a demonstration of agape love. Steeter later became the first Christian martyr, showing selfless love even to the end when he said, "Do not, Lord, do not charge those with this sin. And like Christ, Stephen forgave those who killed him and demonstrated an incredible love towards his murderers. And we have a hard time, it's Thanksgiving, we have a hard time forgiving our family members of some time that they wronged us or hurt us. We hold grudges. But here Stephen and Jesus himself were demonstrating agape love, the people literally killing them, and they were saying, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Who are we to not forgive our family members for something that happened 20 years ago? That really doesn't matter. Stephen's prayer challenges the notion of divine justice, and he advocates for divine forgiveness. Stephen said, forgive them, Lord. God had every right to hold that sin against them because they were murderers. That would be God's divine judgment, or God's divine justice, rather. But Stephen is saying, Lord, hold back your divine justice. Unleash your divine forgiveness in this situation. Forgive them, Lord. Stephen's love embodied what Gantt defines as of Christian love and sets a powerful example that many Christian martyrs throughout the ages have followed ever since. That example of, forgive them, Lord. Withhold your justice and forgive them. 
It's about withholding the punishment that they rightly deserve and intentionally releasing forgiveness. Some of us tonight need to hear that. You might be holding a grudge against some people and you're intentionally holding them responsible and you are making them pay for their actions through how you talk to them, how you treat them. Different things you may be doing, withholding things from them, good stuff. And that's not forgiveness. That's a grudge. But the call of agape on every one of us believers is to let go, to forgive it. Well, I'm not going to say let go and let God because that's not scriptural. Let go and ask God to forgive them and release love. Third, a common confession. Disciples are unified in our common confession of faith. The Great Commission lays out the good news of the gospel as the confession of our faith. What is that? Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47 clarifies the specific detail that the church admits that Jesus is the Messiah, which is the apostles' doctrine. If, if our confession isn't around the messiahship of Jesus, then we are speaking a false doctrine. This is one of the many reasons why Islam is a false religion, because they don't admit that Jesus is the son of the living God. They, they call him Messiah, but they don't believe that he is the son of God. And that is incorrect. The doctrine of the, the apostles is that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. So anything that denies the lordship or the divinity of Christ, anything that denies the messiahship and the divinity of Christ is a false teaching. And so that simple confession of the Lord's divinity and his messiahship is a part of our common confession. Through faith in the risen Lord and baptism, souls are added to the church. Paul goes on to tell the congregation of the Church of Rome that salvation is through both heartfelt conviction and verbal confession that Jesus is the risen Lord. That's Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 10, or what we sometimes refer to as the Roman road or the Romans road. Repentance, baptism, and a common confession of faith and the ascendant Lord Jesus Christ must be a celebration and the central celebration of any of our corporate gatherings. Our common confession of faith was codified in the the Nicene Creed, sometimes referred to as the Apostles' Creed, and unified early church believers at the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. This was what many refer to as the last of the great ecumenical documents where all believers from all different walks, various faiths, and again, this is pretty early, um, they agreed upon this. This was the central core tenets The Christian faith. It is the mortar that adheres believers together and unifies the kingdom against foundational division that often happens. Next, intentional action. This is the last of the four, I promise. Intentional action. James chapter 2, verse 17 stands out as a clear catalyst for Christian action. As the author of James says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. In this scriptural section, James asks about the profitability of saving faith without accompanying works that demonstrate faith's presence. James advocates for attending action as a demonstration of saving faith in the life of a believer. So in other words, put quite simply, If your life doesn't bear fruit of the faith, then your confession is not genuine. If your life doesn't bear the fruits of the Spirit, or isn't in the process of bearing fruits of the Spirit, then one's confession is not genuine. It's not real. Say, Pastor, how can you judge somebody? Well, simple. I'll look at the fruits in your life. Pretty easy to to see somebody that's truly a Christian or not. You know the best way to do that? I'll go look in your social media page. I'll look at your Facebook page and see the type of stuff you're doing. It's the easiest way to see if somebody is truly bearing fruits or not.
So James advocates again for attending action or action as a demonstration of saving faith in the life of a believer. See, there's a difference between saving faith and just faith. The Bible says that the demons believe and they tremble before God, and rightly so. But that faith isn't saving faith. James even writes that and talks about it in the second chapter there as showing a demonstration of the difference between saving faith and just belief. Demons believe and they tremble. And they should tremble. But you and I, we must have faith that has accompanying action. And when our lives bear fruit worthy of salvation, when our lives bear the fruits of the Spirit, then we can say we have genuine saving faith. How can somebody who believes in Jesus as the risen Lord, again, the difference between Savior and Lord, how can one have Jesus as their Lord go through life in any other way than to be changed from their sinful nature into a new creation. The Bible says that we are a new creation, a new creature in Jesus Christ. Behold, all things have passed away. All things have become new. And so if you haven't experienced that newness of your life, if you haven't experienced the passing of old things, of old sinful nature, if you haven't experienced fruits of the Spirit manifested and growing and becoming even more in your life, we got to ask, is your faith saving faith or intellectual faith? Intellectual faith that even causes demons to tremble. Therefore, the manifestation of saving grace, saving grace activated by genuine faith will naturally produce obedience revealed by righteous actions. Paul likewise encourages the very churches he addresses in his letters to abstain from the works of the flesh and walk in the spirit. If you are a Christian and you are walking in the flesh, how can you do that and still confess that you are a Christian? This is indicative of action. Again, it's it's the fruits that you're bearing. And action requires intentionality or intention to become apparent in a believer's life. I have to intentionally choose not to lie, not to steal, not to have an affair with my wife, you not to speak profanely. I have to make the choice to love because agape is selflessness. It is service. I have to make the choice to serve. And you know what? Sometimes it ain't easy. I'm on here tonight ministering to you. And if I could share with you, even an inkling of what my life really is like day to day. You might ask where I have time to even do this. But it's intentional. I have to make a conscious choice, and so do you, to walk in the Spirit and abstain from the things of the flesh. Paul is careful to demonstrate that salvation is not by works, No, it's not by walking in the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit are byproducts of saving faith, activating the grace of God in our lives towards salvation. And it requires obedience. And so obedience, therefore, becomes the central theme of actionable faith. Christ's command in in the Great Commission is to go. That is an action word. It requires a response of going of putting one foot in front of the other, making that effort, intentional actionability. Accordingly, actionable faith obeys the order of God. God says, do it. you got to go. And God has commanded that the gospel be preached. Jesus said, go into all the world preaching the gospel, and everyone who believes will be saved. And everyone who doesn't believe will be condemned. Do you want people to be condemned? Do you want people to go to hell? I don't. Not all of us are called to be evangelists and preach to sinners, but all of us are called to be evangelical in our lives, in our approaches, in in seasoning our words as with salt, as Christ said, looking for every opportunity. When we speak with somebody, speaking, thinking before we speak, and then seasoning our words to have impact in their lives, so at some point they're going to want to come back for more. Are we even doing that? 
God calls his followers to righteousness and obedience to our trust that he is the living God. And that leads to actions of righteousness over fleshly living. Observation is both consistent with faith and rises from faith. God clarifies that obedience is better than sacrifice in 1 Samuel 15, 22. Many of God's judgment against Israel and Judah were a direct result of their disobedience. And some of us today are walking in disobedience because we are not obeying what God has told us to do. And he's told us to love. He has told us to forgive. He has told us to share our salvation, to to tell others about Jesus. It's as simple as opening your mouth and saying it. But some of us are walking in disobedience, willfully not doing what the Lord has put in our hearts to do, and what he's commanded us to do even in scripture. Intentional action through obedience, submission to Christ fulfills the commandment of Christ to love in John 15, 12. From the deliberate action to love in fulfillment of Christ's commandment, a disciple circles back to the beginning of all four of these traits of humility, love, common confession, intentional action. And so these traits of a biblical disciple runs throughout time from the time of those who follow Christ in person to us today. The Holy Spirit is still working in us through that process I talked about called sanctification, where we are becoming more and more like Christ in our actions, our minds, our words, our deeds. Reverend Harper, as I talked about at the beginning, he knew his eternal reward. And he feared for those who did, would die not knowing Christ. He knows that we are all sinners in desperate need of the Savior. But we are also, as Christians, in desperate need of the Lordship of Christ Jesus in our lives. And when we experience the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ, through his grace activated by our genuine saving faith, then a disciple desires nothing more than to bring other people into that experience. And so tonight, as I come to a close, I want to ask each and every one of you really to look at your life. Take inventory of your faith. Take inventory of the actions of your faith. Look at the fruits of your faith. And I want you to ask yourself, where am I doing good? Where could I use improvement? And if you want To have some help with that, I've actually created a survey over these four specific traits that I would be happy to send to you. You can take this survey, and it'll show you some things, if you're honest in that survey, areas where you can possibly improve, and it'll show you areas in your life that you're doing good at. And if that's something that you would like, just shoot me an email at bootcampministries at gmail.com. I would love to send that to you. Um, Just be honest and open with it. And as we bring back Pastor Manti. Man, I was just trying to get the... (laughs) I was trying to like, oh yeah, the discipleship inventory. I have to do that. You shared that with with myself uh, earlier today. And And a couple uh, others. It's a, yeah, it, it's a, it's a real important question, um, to take a step back and just take inventory, like you said, because boy, gotta be careful. Slip up. We can uh, get used to the way we've been doing things as if it's, if it's the Lord's will when it's not, uh, as if we doesn't want us to grow anymore or something, uh, or like we're not going to, you know, like pruning isn't a thing for us anymore. All that stuff can happen if we don't uh, take a step and say, hang on. The, the survey is really quite extensive, by the way. Um, it's not just lots of questions. Yeah. What's that? Eight, eight questions for every topic there. Each of the yeah. Four. And it's very, very helpful. I think it, it will be. So, uh, again, if, if folks want that, definitely email Chris, uh, bootcampministries at gmail.com direct. Uh, or you can just hop on the End Time Church app and um, at him. You know, at Pastor Anderson, 
uh, and he'll get it to you that way. I'm sure that's not a problem either. And if it is, it's not now because I just said to do it. Uh, <laughs> now they're going to do it. We'll make it uh, happen. Anyway, no, it's, it's uh, dude, I, I super appreciate you doing this. Cause like, like Chris said, it's, if you saw the guy's schedule, he shouldn't even be on here. Um, but it's a, it's a commitment to, to serve in this way, to serve the body of Christ, to serve the Lord himself. Uh, and maybe even to serve the lost who might be, uh, checking in because you just don't know. You just don't know. Um, sure hope so. Yeah, you do. Oh, I really do hope so. Um, and you know, we had a, at my local church this week, we had two very, very dear people pass away and, um, suddenly, and it's just, other than it being tough, it's a reminder to me about how really precious every single day is Uh, every single day. It's today is the day of salvation. We can't let it go. We, we, we can't let it pass us by and not tell someone about the Lord or not minister to someone who's hurting or not. You know, being the best husband or father, brother, son, uncle, friend, you know, whatever in our case um, it is. So, yes, today matters. It matters a lot because we don't know if tonight's the night we go home. So let's just be about it. And, um, brother, I thank you, man. Uh, as always, Lord willing, be back again next Next week here at End Time Church, obviously, if there's any prayer requests, again, submit that form. We'll we'll get it right away and pray for you immediately and get back with you if you should so desire. Um, love you, man. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to your household for um, agreeing to continue to do this. We appreciate you big time. Well, until next time, same bat channel, same bat time. <laughs> Indeed, or just click on endtime.church. Either way. All right, friends. Love you so much.